This video has been made with the purpose of education and awareness of real crimes and there is no disrespect intended to anyone. This is to help promote truth and justice for anyone who has been a victim of crime. What I'm about to report is what I have researched online and I will welcome any corrections should they be required. Hey there little berries and newberries, sorry for the delay with this video uh, but um, I'm going to have this out for you as soon as I can get it done. It's an unsolved case in my view and in a lot of people's views but in the view of the US military it's solved. The US military believe that Lavina Lynn Johnson committed suicide on the 19th of July 2005 while on on her base in Iraq. However, even their own investigation contradicts itself. It's obvious that Lavina did not kill herself. I would like you all, when you've watched this video, to click on the change.org link petition down below and add your signature to the petition to reopen Lavina's case. It has been going for quite some time. It needs half a million people to sign it and it's not there yet. We need more people to sign it. When you've done that, when you've signed it, it will ask you to confirm your email and then it will ask you to share that link. So you can share it to Facebook, to WhatsApp, to Twitter, whatever. Share that link below. Tell everybody that you can about her case. Get them to sign that petition. I'm not asking you to promote this video myself or, or anyone else. I'm just asking you to share that link and get Lavina's name out there. Get her case reopened. It's been 18 years, almost to the day, and her family needs justice. Lavina Lynn Johnson was born on the 27th of July in 1985 in Florissant, Missouri to parents John and Linda Johnson. She was the fourth of five children. Her three older siblings were all boys and she had a younger sister. Her brothers were John Jr., Jay Vince and Jermaine, and her younger sister was Lakeisha. The whole family was very close, very tight-knit. They loved each other very, very much. They weren't a dysfunctional, problematic family. They were very close and very loving. Lavina was smart as a whip. She was an honor roll, straight A student. Apparently she was on the honor roll 95% of her time she was in school. She played the violin in the school orchestra. She was very mature for her age, beyond her years. She decided when she was very young that she would become a vegetarian. She supported Vega and Peter, giving her own pocket money to Peter. She got involved in recycling, donating her blood, feeding the homeless. She was so loving and giving and yet so smart, but she didn't think of herself as being better than anybody. She loved to look after people and she was particularly close to her father. John Johnson Sr. was an army veteran. He then left the army, became a psychologist and he worked as a civilian for the army for 30 years. He said that Lavina was very much like him. She was his mini me. And he said that she was more like him than any of their kids. Lavina also looked up to her father. I think he was her idol. She would love to have been as honorable and as good as her father. What Lavina really wanted to do was go to college and get a job in the movie industry. And her brothers wanted to help her get herself a business up together so they could run a family ran movie production business and then move into music produ production. This was her dream. But her younger sister, Lakeisha, they would be going to college at roughly the same time. And Lavina was very concerned that having two young daughters in college at the same time would have a huge financial burden on the family. But the parents had saved up money for their daughters to go to university. So Lavina said, look, do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna follow in my father's footsteps. I am gonna go into the US military. I am going to serve for a few years, earn some money myself so I can support myself through college. Dr. Johnson tried his best to dissuade his daughter from going into the military. He knew that women didn't always have a good time in the military. There was a lot of misogyny, women being looked down on, and sometimes being the victims of sexual assaults as well as harassment and bullying and degradation. He didn't want her going into that. She was tiny, really small, she was five foot one. Yet she was so determined and so strong-willed that nothing her parents could say could dissuade her. 
She wanted to go into the US military and she wanted to support herself going through college so that her parents could use the finances they'd accrued to pay for her baby sister to go to college. This is how amazing Lavina was. After graduating from Hazelwood Central High School, Lavina immediately enlisted in the US Army and when she graduated from the Army, she was deployed to Iraq. John Johnson commented that when he went to Lavina's Army graduation, when she passed out of the Army, that people commented about how strong-willed and tough-minded she was, despite her tiny little stature. She weighed 110 pounds or 7 stone 12 and was 5 foot 1, yet she made up for it with this toughness about her, this determination about her. When she was deployed to Iraq, she had attained the rank of Private First Class and she was deployed to a place called Balad in Iraq. She worked on a military base and a non-combat role. She was responsible for opening and closing and running a communication center. This also meant that Lavina was able to telephone and contact her parents and her other friends and family a lot more frequently than someone who didn't work in the, in the communication center. So she had access to outside contact. Part of Lavina's role was to open and close that particular center each day, so that was her responsibility. Dr. Johnson was very concerned for his daughter's safety while she was out there. He he knew how strong his daughter was, but at the same time, there were people in the army that could take advantage of her. Lavina regularly reported to her parents that she was enjoying her time out there in Iraq, in the desert, in the heat, but she did let them know a few times that there were some things that happened that showed that her male colleagues disrespected her simply because of her gender. On the 17th of July in 2005, Lavina called home and spoke to her father. She said during this conversation that something had happened the day either the day before or two days prior, that Lavina was reprimanded because her male colleagues disrespected her. So what happened was she was closing the communication center one evening and she told the male soldiers there to leave and they wouldn't. And they even sort of blanked her as if she wasn't there. They completely disrespected her. She tried to assert herself and say, you need to get out now. In the end, she had to get someone to help her. So she went and got a general. Now a general is very high ranking. They are several steps above a private first class and the general got those men out of that communication center. But instead of saying to them, she's responsible for opening and closing this place. So if she says, get out, you get out. I don't care what you think of her. He should have reprimanded those male soldiers, but no, he reprimanded Lavina, saying that her voice was too soft and she needed to be more assertive. Dr. Johnson said, that is not good. And while you're out there in Iraq, she'd been out there for six weeks at this point, in six, between six and eight weeks, he said to her, you need a battle buddy. A battle buddy is someone whom you are basically linked with 24 seven. You go everywhere with each other. You look out for each other. You don't leave each other's side. You act as witness, protection, um, accountability, responsibility. And it's common practice for people to have a battle buddy, especially women. Lavina says she didn't really want to do that. And she didn't report a lot of these incidents where she was being disrespected because she didn't want the repercussions coming back on her. Dr. Johnson said to his daughter, if you do not get yourself a battle buddy, then I will make the arrangements for you. And he knew how to do that because he'd been in the army. In this phone call of the 17th, Lavina told her father a few other things. She said that her unit was gonna come back to the United States in a few months. She was gonna spend a year in the States, go back to Iraq, complete her work there. Then she was going to leave the army and then go to college. She commented that that's what really she should have done in the first place, that she really should have listened to her father, that maybe she wasn't enjoying her time in the army and didn't feel it was everything that she, it was cracked up to be. The next day she was going to go to a class to see about what her new job would be. So I believe she was going to be no longer working in communications, it was gonna be something else. And she said then that she would work out if she wasn't gonna be working in communications, how she would make further contact. Before leaving the conversation, Lavina made one last request. And this was that the tradition that she, her father and her younger sister had 
at Christmas, which was the Saturday after Thanksgiving, the three of them would decorate the Christmas tree together. And she didn't want to miss out on that. She wanted to have that time with them. So she said that she'd be in the States during Christmas and she would try and get leave to come home for Christmas. So they said, do not decorate the tree without me. And this was in July. So she was planning ahead several months. During this time, Lavina did have a steady boyfriend who I believe was back home in the States. He was also in the army. But roughly around this time, he basically called it quits with her and she was a little bit upset about it but she wasn't too bothered about it she believed that they would get back together as soon as she was back in the states some of her friends observed that lavina began to smoke while she was deployed and she hadn't before she was also eating quite a lot of ice cream but that's expected when you're in a desert two days after this phone call with lavina at 7 30 tuesday morning the Johnsons were in bed and the doorbell rang. Dr. Johnson jumped up and his wife went to the window. She said, there's a soldier at the door. And Dr. Johnson knew that this was not good news. Now, I don't know a lot about the ranks in the army, but Dr. Johnson, when he went to the door, he saw that the person there, although they were a soldier, their rank was staff sergeant. And he felt that if they were contacting him, if they were if they were knocking on the door, he felt that if they were ringing their doorbell at half past seven of a morning, it could only mean that something bad had happened to Lavina. Yet, when Dr. Johnson saw who it was, it was a staff sergeant. And apparently, if it's something bad, it should be an officer or a chaplain if it were a death. The staff sergeant said to Dr. Johnson that he had a message from the Secretary of Defense. Lavina Lynn Johnson was found dead that morning, 19th of July, 2005, by self-inflicted wounds. Dr. Johnson fell back, literally fell back in shock. His wife, who was up on the balcony, heard what was said and she collapsed and shrieked and screamed, waking up the rest of the family, who all banded together. The staff sergeant just stood there, stoic, robotic, no feeling, no emotion, nothing, while the family were grieving. Dr. Johnson said that he didn't receive any letter or official document or anything, it was just word of mouth. So he never knew really the full story from what that person had said. Mrs. Johnson started crying, someone killed my baby. She knew that there's no way that her daughter took her own life. No way. She was planning ahead. She was looking to the future. She wanted to come home for Christmas. There was no sign whatsoever that she was ever going to take her own life. After an autopsy and investigation, Lavina's body was returned to the United States in a coffin draped in a American flag. The army had told the parents it's best to have a closed casket funeral because her body was in pretty bad way and it would be quite distressing to see her body. But the Johnsons wanted to see their daughter they hadn't seen her since she had left the States for Iraq. They wanted to say goodbye. When they looked at Lavina, she wasn't in a terrible state. She didn't look right. There were some injuries to her face. What Dr. Johnson and Linda Johnson had been told by the army was that the way that Lavina had committed suicide was that she had gone into a contractor's tent, which was not at her post, off limits to military personnel. She had printed out emails from her ex-boyfriend, set them on fire using an accelerant and a match, then taken her M16 rifle and shot herself in the mouth. Now, Dr. Johnson, he'd been in the army. He knew all about the M16 rifle. It's huge. It's massive. There was something not right about this. Dr. Johnson could see that the wounds on Lavina's face, there were wounds, but not explained by an M16 rifle bullet to the mouth or even to the head. 
it's a massive shot. And he knew that if you put an M16 rifle in your mouth and pull the trigger, it will blow half your head off. It's huge and you get a massive gaping wound at the back of your head, if anything. But what Lavina had was no visible injuries to her mouth, but one bullet wound to the side of the head. He could see that that was the entrance wound, not the exit wound, and a track was clearly shown going down. This didn't sit right with him, nor his wife. Nobody believed that Lavina had taken her own life. And what the family also observed was that Lavina was wearing her dress gloves. They tried to get the gloves off, but the gloves had actually been glued to her hands. When the Johnsons asked the funeral home, why did you glue her hands, to, her gloves to her hands? And they said she came with the gloves already on. But there's no reason why she would be wearing her dress gloves. Later transpired using the pictures from the cro what I believe to be a crime scene, she wasn't wearing any gloves. The gloves were eventually prized from her hands and it turned out Lavina had third degree burns on her hands. So the gloves were put on her to conceal them. The Johnsons weren't happy. So they demanded using the Freedom of Information Act to access all of the records of the investigation into Lavina Johnson's death. And they received copies, not very good copies, of the documents and photographs of the photographs of the crime scenes and photographs of the files. Dr. Johnson's brother was also an army veteran. Many people in this family had served in the army. Dr. Johnson's brother was a criminologist. He looked at the information with Dr. Johnson. They all did. And they believed that it is blatantly obvious that this was a homicide. She did not kill herself. There were inconsistencies in the statements about who found her in what condition, where she was lying, where she wasn't lying. Was the gun lying over her? Was it on the side? Somebody moved it, somebody didn't move it. Some people said that she was smoking and on fire. Some people said there was no smoke or no fire. The bullet was also never found. The army personnel checked for fingerprints and found there were no fingerprints at all on the M16 rifle. There were no fingerprints on the aerosol, on the matchbook, or anywhere in that contractor's tent. Now that tent was for contractors, so civilians working for the army in Iraq, and they were beyond the boundaries of where Lavina was allowed to go. It was off limits. That tent was for the contractors to take their break. When Lavina was found, she was found wearing her jogging gear. Looking at the report, it also appeared to imply that Lavina actually died two days before she was found. That means the very day that she last spoke to her parents. Later that night, John Johnson said that he had some witnesses, so I don't know if these are people who came out later, but they said they tried to get in contact with Lavina. They knocked on her dorm room. They couldn't get hold of her. The next morning on the Monday, nobody had seen her. She failed to turn up for a class and she was actually reported missing on the Monday morning. And she was then found the following morning in that tent. The Johnsons put a file together and they sent it to the US military saying, this is not a suicide and here's why. This is a homicide and you're covering this up. The army refused to open the case. They said, no, it's suicide, end of, case closed, done, dusted, the end. They refused. Dr. Johnson also noticed something else in the file, which was a photograph of a CD. The CD was not provided as part of the information that he received. He wanted that CD. The army refused. They said he was not entitled to it. He told them that besides the army, the family are the other people who are absolutely entitled to it in line with the Privacy Act. 
the army still refused. The Johnsons went to a man called William Lacey Clay, who was the US representative in Missouri, to try and get him to procure that CD. Clay went to the hearing for another veteran's death that was suspicious by someone by the name of Pat Tillman. Pat Tillman was a former NFL star who then went into the army after he finished his professional football career. He died while in combat and it was originally put down to him having died as a result of enemy fire but it later turned out to be friendly fire and this has been a huge storm. People believe that he was cold-bloodedly murdered. That is a subject for another video, but that is another one that we need to bear in mind. Clay went to the army and basically said, under the Freedom of Information Act, you need to give this CD to the Johnsons. Clay went through his normal procedure and he did manage to force, I suppose, the army to give the CD to them. On the CD were very disturbing photographs of the crime scene, of the autopsy, and of Lavina's naked body on the autopsy table. And it revealed horrible things. It showed that she had been beaten. On her torso, she had severe bruising, bite marks, and scratches on her neck. There's no way that her shooting herself would produce all of those things. They were very fresh and then they're not the kind of bruises and injuries that will turn up after death. Her teeth were broken. But what was very disturbing was that there was a picture of her genitals and it was very clear from this that there was something inside her vagina, which the Johnsons thought was lime because in a contractor's tent, they have building materials. It looked like somebody had poured lime into her vagina and it had basically gone rock solid. But later on, the Johnsons looked at this and thought, actually, this looks a lot like Woundstat, which is a powder which isn't used anymore, I believe, where soldiers pour it into a wound to stop the bleeding. But if it's left in there too long, if it goes hard, then you cannot extract it. It has to be, phys has to be surgically removed. And that's what appeared to have happened to Lavina, that this substance, this wound stat, had been poured into her vagina, it had gone rock hard, and it had set. This was not right, not right at all. And the Johnsons lobbied for a long time to try and get Lavina's case reopened. And eventually, an attorney who had 40 odd years experience in uncovering cover-ups, and also to do with the army, he is the best in his field, Donald Watkins. Donald Watkins saw Lavina's story on Facebook and he reached out to the Johnsons and said, I wanna take on this case. And he's one of those attorneys that says, I'm not gonna go into it with a predetermined outcome. All I want is the evidence and I will follow the evidence. Literally, the evidence leads you down a path. You don't lead the evidence, it leads you. He looked at the case files and he agreed that this was definitely not a suicide. Now, looking at one of the previous cases I've done, the Seddon family murders, Bob Seddon, <laughs> there's no way he could have been able to reach the trigger of that sawn off shotgun. And that was what told the police this was not a suicide because he physically couldn't do it. He wasn't Stretch Armstrong. Lavina was five foot one. The M16 rifle is huge. It's about 40 inches. There's no way she could have reached the trigger. And what was also very telling is that there were no fingerprints on that rifle. Nobody's. A lot of people who had given their statements said that Somebody moved the rifle away from Lavina's body when they were checking for signs of life, but even their fingerprints weren't found on it, so that rifle had been cleaned. There were no fingerprints from Lavina anywhere at all in that tent. Another thought is maybe she pulled the trigger with her toes. She was wearing her jogging boots when she was found. There was blood 
outside of the tent in boot prints. There was a lot of gravel and debris on her back, which showed that she'd been dragged. Donna Watkins believed, as the Johnsons believed, that Lavina Johnson had been murdered. And it's likely that she'd been murdered because she'd seen something that she wasn't meant to see. And what was the deal with the wound stat in her vagina? Her medical records showed that while she was out there, Lavina had contracted a sexually transmitted disease. They said it was condyloma, which I believe is similar or the same as genital warts, and she was having treatment on site. The army said that she was screwing around, but Lavina's friends said she told them a completely different story, that she'd been raped two to three weeks before she died. And this is how she attained that disease. Donald Watkins and the Johnsons knew they had to go further and it was Donald Watkins that said we need to exhume her body. We need to do a second autopsy. The Johnsons didn't want their daughter exhumed. They didn't want to disturb her. But ultimately, it was necessary. The second autopsy was carried out by two different independent people in Missouri. And the conclusion to those autopsies that the cause of death was inconclusive. What was very disturbing though, was when Lavina's genitals were checked, it turned out that parts of her vagina and her anus had been removed. There was no documentation in the army's autopsy report for that. Also, when Donald Watkins was looking at the body, he believed that Lavina died from a gunshot wound to the side of the head by a handgun, not by a rifle. That it's likely that the bullet track, the way it was going through the head, that the bullet actually lodged in the tongue. But there was no information about any examination of the tongue. So in the second autopsy, they checked for Lavina's tongue, but it was gone. Her tongue had also been removed. Dr. Johnson believed that his daughter had been subjected to a sexual assault, which is why Woundstat had been poured into her vagina and why it had been removed. Yet the army said they didn't carry out a rape kit. They didn't carry out an examination of her sexual organs because they believed wholeheartedly this to be a suicide and there'd be no reason for it. Yet the army had specifically photographed her genitals with that coagulated wound stat. <sighs> Everything they've said contradicts itself. Looking through all of this, the Johnsons and Donna Watkins actually do have a suspect in mind. Now, logic dictates that if there's this level of cover-up and it goes quite high to several people in the army, is when you look at armies and armed forces, I don't know whether I'm right when I'm saying this, and please correct me if I'm not. It's very within itself. If something happens on, you know, a barracks or whatever, you don't complain to the police. You go to the, the, you know, the people that you need to in the army. If a crime takes place involving someone in the forces, it's investigated by the army. So everything that was done in this case was looked at by the army about a crime involving the army. So there's, to be honest, nobody independent here because everybody on that base in Iraq should have been a suspect. Everybody. It shouldn't have been investigated there. It should have been investigated separately. Probably, I, I don't know whether the FBI had jurisdiction over this. I presume they would because if you're on a base, then technically speaking, you're not actually living in that country. You are living as a, as a US citizen on a military base there. The second autopsy also revealed that Lavina had a broken neck. Now this was not post-mortem. How can you shoot yourself with a broken neck? And she also had a broken nose that had been reset post-mortem. Now these body parts were not removed and these, this damage caused to her after she had been released from the army. This had happened before. This had happened before she had been interred. Donna Watkins believes that a very high ranking officer in the army is responsible for what happened to Lavina. He believes that Lavina, through no fault of her own, she saw something 
that she really wasn't meant to see, which was somebody very high ranking doing something they shouldn't be doing. And because of that, she was killed to keep her quiet. Now they do have a suspect in mind. We can't name them, of course, but what they found in Lavina's belongings was that she had written in her notes what the chain of command is. And this particular suspect that they had was in that chain of command and they were quite high up. That's when a cover up happens, when it involves somebody very high up who has power to say yes or no, or has the, the ability, I suppose, to put the frighteners on other people, has the power to have control of other people. And if the army investigates itself, then anything the army says won't be investigated by anyone else independent, will it? Because isn't it a conflict of interest? I'm sorry, but is it? If a soldier dies while in deployment on the base where it is not a case of combat, if they die from a wound that happens to them and even if it's blatantly obvious that it's a suicide, it still needs to be investigated. You can't just say, yeah, it's a suicide, let's investigate it as a suicide. No. Lavina's mother and her sister have both been made extremely ill because of what's happened. Dr. John Johnson has not given up the fight for justice for his daughter. Now, I reiterate that we need as many signatures as we can on that change.org petition. I may not be an American citizen, but I've signed it because I'm a human being. Lavina was a human being. We're all human beings that live on this planet. We need to look out for each other. And nobody was looking out for Lavina. So we need to look out for her now. And we need to show her support for her family. If we can get enough signatures on that petition to get the army to reopen it, then that would be the best thing that we can do. But in my opinion, just in my opinion, I don't know what I, I'm, I said, I'm not an American citizen. I don't know the law there, but does the FBI have any jurisdiction here? Is there any way that we can get anybody independent to potentially press charges here? If it's still being looked at by the army and the person that they are investigating is someone very senior within the army, they're going to be very reluctant to do anything, aren't they? Remember back to what happened to little Dennis Jurgens. His adoptive uncle was very senior in the police force and he tried his best to protect his sister and he did for quite some time. There are many other people who have died on military bases and they've blatantly been murdered, but their deaths have been covered up. Or people who have been reported to have died from enemy fire and it turns out to be friendly fire. This sort of thing shouldn't happen. The army is there to protect people, but it doesn't protect the people within it. I'm hoping that Lavina Johnson's case can be reopened. That's not a guarantee that anyone will be prosecuted or even if the ruling has changed from suicide to homicide, but at least it gives the family a chance. Please get her name out there. Share that link wherever you can. There are many other true crime YouTubers who have covered this and they've tried their best to get this out there. I have gone to another YouTuber who was instrumental in getting uh, Ellen Ray Greenberg's case into the public eye. Um, it was already in the public eye, but it needed a bit more of a boost because blatantly Ellen Ray Greenberg did not kill herself. Her death was ruled a suicide. She apparently stabbed herself a number of times, including in the back of her neck with a, again, with a blade that was too long for her hand. It amazes me when people just do not take into account the laws of physics and the fact that people don't have stretchy limbs when it comes to using weapons to kill themselves. It really amazes me. But please, guys, can we do what we can? Get Lavina's name out there. Get her case reopened and get justice for her family. Thank you very much for watching this, guys. I want to give a shout out to my four lovely channel members, Denti and Shaz, Alf, Candy Ray, and Checking Convictions. Thank you so much. I would love to have more of you as members, as newberries. Every time I get a new newberry, I add a tree to the orchard. So everyone who comes here becomes a member of the orchard. And I would like to give my uh, members early access. I would like to give them a lot more things such as videos specifically for them and also posts specifically for them. 
but thank you very much again for watching this i hope you're all well wherever you are and i wish you all the very best my lovely little berries bye bye